Great. Well, again, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's grant solicitation webinar, OJJDP FY 2019 Family Drug Courts Program Grant Solicitation. My name is William Moore, and I am with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. As your technical host, I would like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform that provide a few announcements to keep in mind. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be published on INTAC's YouTube page. The webinar recording will be archived on INTAC's YouTube page where you can also view past webinars. For the event transcript and supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. For those wishing to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and other important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here, you will also find an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions. Click on the name of the file, then click the download button. During today's webinar, presenters will address questions during our Q&A segment of the webinar. Please type your questions into the chat box as they arise. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute to help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything at this time. And I'll give some folks a couple of seconds to do this. Again, only type the number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything at this time. All right. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be provided with a link to a brief survey about today's presentation. The feedback you provide is used to assist in future planning and training. And following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. The certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via an Adobe Connect thank you email. Please keep an eye on your email for the certificate. Please note that only participants that are registered and signed in will receive a certificate of attendance. I will now turn over the webinar today to our moderator and presenter, Katherine Berry. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Again, this is Katherine Berry. I am the Grants Management Specialist at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, or OGJDP for short, as we like to say. Uh, and I manage the Family Drug Court Program portfolio. Um, and I'm very excited to uh, be able to chat with you guys about this uh, solicitation that's out and funding opportunity for you all. And I am scrolling through the chat window and seeing all the different folks from, uh, we got DC, we got Illinois, we got Mississippi, Indiana, West Virginia, Louisiana. Um, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and so many more. And I'm really excited to have all of you. If I didn't give you a shout out, I, I apologize. There's so many of you. Um, and I also see that there are 11 people in one room watching this webinar. That must be a fun party over there. Uh, but I'm excited uh, to have all of you here and to provide hopefully um, a bit more information than uh, what's already in the solicitation um, perhaps uh, clarify a few things that might be confusing and just um, 
really make sure to uh, hone in on the things that you should focus on uh, when writing your application and developing your program design uh, so that uh, you can put your best foot forward this year. So this is the welcome webinar for applicants who um, may or may not apply for the Family Drug Court uh, FY 2019 solicitation this year. These are the various different areas that I hope to cover today and much more based on uh, whatever questions you guys have for me. But I am going to have um, a general overview of the program today for you. Uh, as well as an overview of the goals and objectives of the Family Drug Court Program and the various different categories of funding we're offering. And then I'm also going to cover any changes and or additions from previous year's solicitations. So if you are um, familiar with previous year's solicitations, you either applied for uh, funding or you uh, received funding, I'm going to make sure today that uh, you are aware of some, some changes and some differences so that, uh, um, again, you can put your best foot forward. And then finally, I'm going to cover application requirements for the various different categories because not every category is going to have these same exact requirements. For those of you who, who have not found the solicitation yet online, uh, we uh, put the uh, link up here for your convenience, although I'm sure all of you have already um, dissected the solicitation by now, hopefully. All applications are going to be due at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on May 29th, although uh, hopefully all of you will be submitting your applications uh, well before 11.59 on April 29th, right? So uh, a general overview. Uh, I, again, I'm, I'm not going to be going over every single word of the solicitation. As you uh, saw, it is almost 50 pages long. So I'm going to focus on the important areas. One important uh, uh, detail that I would like to point out is that this will be a three-year grant if you are awarded funding through this program. Um, sometimes awardees get um, a little confused uh, about how long their the award is for and I want to make sure you all know that this is a three-year program. So if awarded funds, um, you are to plan out your budget and your uh, proposals over a three-year period. So that also includes your timelines. The timelines that you submit with this application are to include a three-year period. The overall goal for this program has not changed in years. Um, overall goal is to enhance either existing family drug courts or help jurisdictions implement new family drug courts to provide substance abusing parents with treatment and accountability by offering access to recovery services that will ultimately protect children, reunite families, and when safe to do, to do so, expedite permanency. Um, that is an overall goal that has uh, never really changed for this program. So this year's solicitation is going to offer three different categories of funding two of which um, we've offered in years past, and one is a brand new area of funding that we're excited about. Category one is enhancing family drug courts. Those are for existing family drug courts that are wishing to enhance their program in some way. Category two is our brand new category of funding entitled Serving Veterans Through Family Drug Courts. And I'll get into each of these categories a little bit more specifically. And category three, establishing new family drug courts. Uh, so for those of you who have applied for funds in the past, uh, this category um, used to be called implementing uh, family drug courts. But it's just the title's been changed, but it's the same goal. 
So the eligibility for applicants is clearly stated on page one uh, through page two of the solicitation. And all for every single category, eligible applicants are limited to states, territories, state courts, local courts, units of local government, and federally recognized Indian tribal governments acting on behalf of a single jurisdiction court. If you have any questions about eligibility, um, feel free to ask now. Um, I know that sometimes um, folks can get a little bit confused about whether or not they're eligible to apply for the funds. For Category 1, Enhancing Family Drug Courts, and Category 2, Serving Veterans Through Family Drug Courts, eligible applicants have to have been fully operational for at least one year. So you have to be a fairly established Family Drug Court program already in your jurisdiction and have been operational for at least one year. For Category 3, Establishing New Family Drug Courts, uh, this is for folks that uh, where no family drug court currently exists in your jurisdiction and you um, are kind of ripe for asking for funds to implement one in your jurisdiction. Um, a drug court that has been open for less than one year is also uh, eligible to apply for those funds as well. So category one, enhancing family drug court. So for those of you um, that are on this webinar and interested in this category of funding, um, I will say that uh, there have been no significant changes uh, to this category compared to previous year's solicitations. Uh, the goals, objectives, and deliverables are still to enhance and or expand uh, services of existing family drug court programs. Um, we have a list of recommended and suggested activities um, for you to consider on page seven, uh, but by no means is that an exhaustive list. Um, we uh, ex fully expect applicants to propose um, enhancements or ex uh, service expansion based on the needs of your jurisdiction and the needs of your court. So, um, feel free to, to make a compelling case um, for a need in, in your jurisdiction that is not listed on page seven. But there are some new activities that we added this year to this category based on uh, needs that we saw in the field um, and also based on kind of best practices that we're seeing that should be implemented in existing family drug courts. And I just wanted to point them out to you on page seven, if you happen to have the solicitation next to you. Um, so we really want people to think about incorporating wraparound recovery support services, in particular um, what are called peer recovery support services, uh, to assist the, the parent participants in your program as well as their families. Um, I will note that if you're unfamiliar what, with what peer recovery support is, um, there's a footnote uh, next to that bullet on page seven, footnote nine, and at the bottom there are a couple of links to what support services, peer, peer recovery support services can look like uh, and uh, give you an idea of um, you know, some additional resources uh, that may help you in your program design, if that's something that you would like to consider incorporating into your program design. Another new activity we added to this category of funding this year, um, if you so choose to do so, is uh, allocating funds to implement recent legislation and or legislative changes in your jurisdiction. Um, for example, example, the Family First Prevention Services Act of 2018, and that is also listed um, on page eight. If you, page seven to eight is where the listed activity, suggested activities are for this category of funding. Category two, serving veterans through family drug courts. This is a brand new initiative that OJJDP is rolling out this year 
Um, we have never um, rolled out an, an initiative under the Family Drug Court Program to serve veterans specifically as um, participants in your courts. Um, but this is an area of need that we um, saw over the, the last two years and finally had an opportunity to um, allocate some funding for existing family drug courts who wish to perhaps um, create a veteran-specific track of funding. And let me take a pause just one second because you all have some questions coming through and I wanna make sure that we answer them in real time before I just roll through, roll through each of these slides. So this is a, a question about eligibility. Um, you know, the requirement that we, um, that if you're in a step, uh, applying for enhancement funds that you be fully established for one year by fully established, we mean operational for, for one year. Um, we're not going to kind of dissect how many folks um, and participants that you've actually graduated from, from your program. Um, we're just going to look at, um, you know, how long you have been fully operational. We understand that um, sometimes it, it takes a little while for things to get up and running. Um, and that it takes a while for you to get that, um, those first few graduates in your, um, uh, uh, out of your program. So, um, you know, as long as you have, you know, had that MOU signed and you've been fully operational for at least one year, um, then you should be good to go as far as applying for enhancement funds. So back to talking about Category 2, our brand new initiative. Um, the goals, objectives, and deliverables for, for this program are really going to be veteran-specific, so providing substance abusing veteran parents with support, treatment, and access to services in family drug courts. Um, so the funding is only um, allowed to be dedicated to veteran participants in your court. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, still serve other um, non-veteran participants in, in your court, obviously, um, but the funding that you apply for, uh, for this category of funding, really has to um, only be uh, dedicated to your veteran participants. So if you are seeing um, a high number of veterans coming through your courtroom or you see an opportunity where you know that there is a um, high veteran population suffering from substance use disorders um, and they are, are likely having troubles, um, w trouble with their families and they would be great candidates for the family uh, uh, treatment court program in your jurisdiction, then this is a good um, I think um, exciting opportunity for you to maybe explore um, providing your veteran uh, population with uh, specific services that will ultimately hopefully lead to their recovery um, and successful outcomes for, for their families. So the objective will be for you in this category to expand or increase access to, access to services available um, through your state child welfare, drug treatment, and court systems to more effectively intervene with veteran parents and their families uh, suffering from uh, uh, substance use disorders. And, um, you know, this is, as I said, a brand new initiative. We um, are, um, we don't know what we're gonna get this year as far as interest and in applicants, but we do know that there is a need um, and we are, are hopeful and excited to see, um, see who applies for this, for this category of funding. So successful applicants in this category um, really should detail a very clear understanding of the veteran population in uh, their community um, and understand the impact of substance use disorders on this particular population and their families. This can be different in every jurisdiction, 
Um, if you don't have a lot of data in, in your jurisdiction um, or a lot of research in your jurisdiction about um, how uh, substance use disorders may be impacting your veteran population and their families, I would invite you to reach out to your veteran serving uh, organizations. Reach out to them, talk to them um, about what data they might have, um, what they're seeing um, as far as folks coming through their door and what services they're asking for. Um, so you may not be able to, you know, type thing, something in line, online and, and, and find a lot of information online, but you certainly will be able to find um, that information at your local veteran serving uh, uh, services agencies. We will expect applicants to develop and execute contracts or memoranda of understanding with local, local veteran and children and family serving agencies. So similar to the MOU that you should already have with your um, children and uh, uh, family serving agencies for your um, family drug court uh, program for your non-veteran participants, we expect that you will develop a similar kind of MOU with uh, the veteran serving agencies in your jurisdiction to understand, um, you know, everybody has a meeting of the minds of how uh, the veterans are going to be served through your family drug court program. We also expect that you will develop a specialized track of services for the veteran participants in your program. Uh, and this includes um, strategizing, figuring out a way to identify the veterans in your family drug court program or figuring out a referral process uh, for veterans to come to your program. You should have a veteran-specific assessment um, as well as hopefully establish peer recovery support for the veteran participants in your program. And then of course, um, provide some opportunities for staff and partner training on uh, veteran needs in the veteran population. I'm gonna stop again because I do um, see another question come in and I don't wanna roll, roll ahead too far before we pass the relevancy of some of the questions coming in. So this is a, a common question asking about um, what are the parameters for incentives um, under this grant, incentives um, to basically um, keep your parent participants engaged or to um, say uh, ensure their participation in the in the court uh, program by offering things like travel um, subsidies etc um, we are pretty um, flexible as far as incentives go um, to to enable you um, to be as flexible as you can to keep your parent participants engaged. Um, it kind of comes down to, um, you know, specifics um, at the time of the budget, but if you do have, um, you know, certain incentives that you're not quite sure would pass federal muster, um, we um, always have chats with our, our grantees about um, what, what flies and what doesn't fly. Um, so I'm happy uh, to always work through our grantee with our grantees about um, figuring out what what incentives are appropriate um, and what probably wouldn't be appropriate with federal funds. Um, but you know, we are pretty pretty flexible, um, and you know I'm not going to get into the specifics of this particular question, but I will say that we are flexible with incentives. So um, definitely include them in your program design if that is. Um, already part of your program design. All right, next slide. So each of the categories um, of, of funding mention, um, you know, something about having um, buy-in or support from, from your partners um, that will ultimately uh, have been working with you and your, with your family drug court program or eventually will be working with you if you're um, applying for the establishing the new family drug court program. But I did want to point out that um, 
this year we are making it mandatory for those of you who are applying for the enhanced uh, category one enhancing family drug courts and category two serving veterans through family drug court programs to submit your um, uh, MOUs uh, with the relevant uh, drug court team members. Um, we find that that's very critical, that if you are an existing family drug court, that you already have a formal MOU established, and we are going to be requiring that you submit that MOU with your application. For folks, category two, um, serving veterans through family drug courts, we are also in addition to the MOU, the regular MOU that you have um, for um, your non-veteran uh, uh, family drug court participants. We also are going to be asking that you submit a, um, it doesn't have to be super formal MOU, but an MOU of sorts with the veteran serving um, agencies in your jurisdiction that you have hopefully already reached out to and talked to and coordinated um, and, and proposed uh, what you would like to do um, with this funding because without their buy-in, um, it's going to make um, your application seem very weak. Um, so we are going to be asking folks from uh, Category 2 serving veterans through family drug courts to also submit um, you know, a, a, an MOU or letters of support from the veteran serving agencies as well. So question that came in about letters of support. Are letters of support required in addition to the MOU for category number one? And that would be enhancing family drug courts. Um, so, if you submit just an MOU, that is going to be fine. I would recommend, though, that you also submit letters of support from the, your partnering agencies because it's just going to make your application that much stronger. Um, the reviewers are going to see not only do you have an MOU, with, your, um, with the relevant partner agencies, but you also have a strong relationship with them that they're willing to provide you with a letter of recommendation, uh, a letter of support. So, you know, it, we have the letters of support slash MOUs um, there, and um, meaning that the letters of support aren't necessarily required, um, but they're, they're definitely recommended, and you certainly will need to submit an MOU for sure. Let me just read some more of these questions as I can tell that this is an area that's um, making a lot of you nervous. So I want to make sure that I read the questions coming in and answer anything that I can off the top of my head rather than directing you to our question help desk at the end of this webinar. So um, a letter of support, is a letter of support from the prosecuting attorney required or is it optional? Again, I'm going to go back to saying, you know, the letters of support um, are, are highly recommended. Um, do you need a letter of support from every single um, uh, drug court team member? Um, not necessarily. I would just say that I would, I would ask letters of support from the partners that you have the best relationships with. I wouldn't ask for letters of support from partners that um, are literally just going to write a few sentences that they um, support you. Um, it should, the letters of support should be from partnering agencies that can, you know, write about your program um, in, in flying colors. Um, it, I don't want you to feel like these letters of support are, you know, to, to just check off a box. Um, they really should be actual letters of support. The most important element here is to just ensure that you provide us with your MOU with all of the relevant key team members um, and partner agencies in the MOU. 
All right, moving on to category three. For those of you who are in the um, planning stages or the thinking stages of establishing a new family drug court in your jurisdiction, um, there have been a few changes to this category if you've tried to uh, apply for this category of funding in the past. Um, the goals, objectives, and deliverables are the same, though, for jurisdictions that are seeking to um, implement a brand new uh, family drug court in your jurisdiction. Um, that is what the funding is for. There are new activities that we are asking applicants to consider um, in this category listed on page nine of the solicitation. And they are basically um, uh, exactly the, the same ones that we added to the enhancement category of funding. We want folks to be thinking about incorporating peer recovery support uh, services in their, um, their program designs. Um, be thinking about it at least because it's, it's as far as best practices, it's good to have, um, as well as ensuring that you are um, implementing recent legislation um, and or legislative changes um, and that you are compliant with legislative uh, uh, changes such as the Family First Prevention Act of 2018. So um, I apologize, this slide is a bit more, bit redundant from the previous slide, but the, um, the big uh, point here that I wanted to make um, is that there have been um, changes from previous years and that for this category of funding, we are not actually requiring that you submit an MOU with the relevant partnering agency. We understand that people um, who are applying for this uh, category of funding may still literally be in the planning stages um, and certainly not at a point of being able to write a formal MOU with all of the relevant children and family services partners um, to make this family drug court happen. Um, you just might be in that beginning stage and need the funds to help kind of get you there. Um, so while we're not requiring a formal an MOU to, to submit as part of your application for this category of funding, uh, we would strongly recommend um, letters of support or partner uh, support. Um, we would like to see that you've at least um, begun the, the discussions um, with the relevant partner agencies and perhaps have gotten letters of support from them. Um, so that is recommended. Um, and I would just put that out there. And what is also kind of new and different from, um, from previous years, and you'll kind of see the, the um, trend and where we're kind of going is that priority will be given to applicants um, who develop a plan or incorporate some sort of plan in their program design uh, that develops a specialized track of services for veteran participants that come through um, come through their program. So for each of the categories of funding, I um, wanted to make sure I pointed out the program design and implementation section of the solicitation, which starts on page 15. Each category of funding um, is required to, um, applicants are required to address eight different components, uh, uh, program components for their category of funding. Um, and if you look, starting on page 15, each of the different kind of bucket areas as far as the eight components are the same for each category, but we're requiring kind of different um, elements for you to hit in your in your program design for each of the different uh, categories of funding. So please be sure that when you are writing your program narrative that you um, take a look at that first because uh, reviewers will be uh, looking to see if you did in fact hit each of the eight program components required for your um, category of funding. Some other um, 
items I would like to point out in this section too, because it's kind of buried in the solicitation, but it's very important, is that programs um, or applicants are, are going to have to certify in your program narrative that one or more designated judge will have responsibility for the judge, uh, family drug court program um, and will supervise the participants. That's a legal requirement that we have to ensure um, are all awardees have that certification. We also have to make sure that um, awardees have identified or created some sort of plan for program evaluation. That does not mean you need to allocate funds for a third party evaluator. Um, we just want to, um, you just need to demonstrate that you do have some form of ongoing program evaluation to um, be able to pivot and make some of those necessary programmatic changes that you may or may not need to do for program success. Um, also, um, you are to explain um, your inability to fund your program without this federal funding um, and also be able to, um, you know, eloquently uh, um, describe a plan for sustaining your program beyond the three years of this award. Um, we want to make sure that applicants um, do have sustainability plans um, written in their, their program narratives um, because ultimately we, we want to see you guys success on, uh, succeed on your own. We also ask that in your program narratives that you certify that funds will supplement and not supplant um, sources of funding that are otherwise available in your jurisdiction. And then this kind of seems um, obvious, um, but we do ask that you make some sort of reference that your services are going to um, address opioid ab abuse reduction. So I'm going to stop and take a look at some of the questions that are coming in. Make sure I don't breeze by. Let's see. So some of these questions, and I apologize if, if you've asked and you're not getting answers from me, it's not because I don't think that your question is very important. Um, it just might be very specific um, to your particular situation or a very specific question that I'll probably direct you to ask. Um, at the very end of um, my presentation, I'm going to give you a number um, an email address to, to send your questions that I'm not able to get to today, and they will be answered for sure um, after this, this, um, this presentation, but I might not be answering them right now um, in the interest of time. And also some of these questions coming in, I do plan to address um, in later slides. So this is, this is a good question, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but from, someone asked, you know, what are some examples of um, how uh, previous grantees or existing grantees were able to find funds for sustainability, um, for example, absorbing the cost within the court or external funding, et cetera. Um, I would say all of those um, <laughs> examples are what some of um, previous grantees and existing um, uh, grantees have been able to do. Um, what's wonderful about the family drug court model is that it's effective and it works. And as soon as um, you know, um, folks start catching wind of the success of your program and what it's doing for um, the parent participants and the, and the families involved and that it's keeping families together, you will see a lot of buy-in um, hopefully, not in every jurisdiction, um, but we've had grantees where the, the court ended up absorbing a lot of the cost because they found that it was in their best interest to help sustain the family drug court program because it was, um, you know, fiscally in their best interest. 
um, as well as you know, there's some grantees that once they got um, their their program up and running, and and um, they were able to then successfully also apply for other federal funding. Um, and we are not the only federal funders for family drug court funding. There's SAMHSA out there as well as some others that um, that fund for particular areas um, um, of your of family drug court programming. So I would say all of the above. Um, and if awarded, I'm always um, good about having those discussions with, with grantees about how we can um, perhaps um, plan for sustainability after the award period. So I am going to move along in the interest of time, but I am going to come back to the questions. Um, and stop every once in a while to kind of give you guys a breather from information and answer questions that might be kind of more interesting than me regurgitating within the solicitation. So budget planning. Um, this is also a section that often gets kind of overlooked by applicants um, that is actually very important. Um, the reviewers will be um, looking at your budget. It's actually an entire section of review for our reviewers. Um, so they will be dissecting your budget and, and taking a hard look at them and making sure that your budgets match um, what you described you, you would do in your program narrative. Um, so make sure that the budgets make sense and that you're not proposing to fund the salaries of anybody um, that wasn't even mentioned in the program narrative. Um, for those of you, it might seem obvious, but we've had that, things like that happen. Um, so the budget really does have to match up to your program narrative and program design. Um, one little item that often gets overlooked in budget section is that uh, every year we do have a, a grantee meeting. So we ask that, uh, okay, applicants budget to travel uh, for a minimum of two grantee meetings in the first year, um, one being kind of a grantee orientation kickoff, um, and then each successive year another grantee meeting. Um, so each of these meetings we, we plan to be in the Washington DC area, so if you're trying to figure out a travel budget for each of these meetings to include in your budget, um, just plan for them all to be in DC. And for these meetings, we require that um, awardees send a minimum of four people, including the project director, family court judge, or judicial officer, a child welfare representative from your team, as well as a treatment representative from your team. Um, and each meeting, for budgetary purposes, just plan for it to be about two and a half days. Um, so this will be something for probably the, the fiscal people in your office to, to work out. Um, but just make sure that if your fiscal people are not on this webinar, that they are aware that that needs to be included and budgeted for in the budget submitted for the application. And note that attendance is mandatory at these grantee meetings. So. Um, definitely make sure it is included in your budget. I'm going to stop for to look at questions. So I apologize for some silence. I got to read through them because you guys ask detailed and excellent questions. Oh, this is an excellent question. So, um, the question is um, that this particular um, applicant is planning to use existing staff salaries for in-kind match. Um, if they are funded by some federal reimbursement, are they correct to assume that we cannot use any of those funds as part of in-kind match? Well, interesting. As I started to read that question a little bit more, um, I'm trying to understand the question. So using um, existing staff salaries as in-kind match is definitely okay. But I'm 
assuming in this person, if you're, if you want to clarify the question, if you mean by if they are funded by some federal reimbursement, are we correct to not use those other funds as part of the in-kind match? Um, by federal reimbursement, do you mean by some other federal program funding that you may be receiving, or if they are funded um, by uh, this award? Um, I need a little bit of clarification there to, to better understand your question. So please please type in and, and ask a clarifying question. Hopefully we can get an answer for you. Okay, reading some more questions. So the current, if you have a current family drug court coordinator, um, or say a specialty docket uh, uh, coordinator, um, they may serve as the project director. That was the question. So, um, and this is another excellent question. Um, do grantee meetings coincide with the National Association for Drug Court Professionals Conference? And years prior, yes. Um, the, the grantee meetings have coincided with the conference um, the grantee meetings are actually organized by the um, OJJDP training and technical assistance provider for this program. And so in years past, that's been the Center for Children and Family Futures, but that award is actually being recompeted this year um, for fiscal year 2019. So we're not um, sure who is going to be the, the Family Drug Court Training and Technical Assistance Provider for this cohort um, for fiscal year 2019. So um, it's kind of up to the, um, the Training and Technical Assistance Provider when those grantee meetings um, will be held. But you can, you can um, it is safe to assume that they will be, um, at the very least, uh, be held in the Washington, D.C. area. So the person that asked the, um, the federal reimbursement question and, and trying to understand um, what can be deemed as in-kind match, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to give you a definitive answer to that question. My gut says that if, if it's not, if it's funds not being used from the OJJDP award, um, then it can be in kind match, regardless of how um, those positions are being funded. Um, because, you know, just because it's federal funds, it doesn't mean that, you know, we're all one, um, we're all interconnected, because we're not. Um, but what I would do is at the end of this presentation, I would direct you to submit that question, either call in that question or email that, that specific question to our little kind of help desk hotline um, for, for all specific questions, general questions that you may have when you're developing um, your applications. So I'm sorry I can provide you with a, a quick answer uh, today, but I assure you we will get you an answer if you submit that question into our email or, or help desk. So, um, I'm gonna keep moving on, past budget planning. So um, I just wanted to um, note that there are performance measures that were developed for the solicitation that are listed in Appendix A of the solicitation. As you may have already seen, that it's a massive number of um, data points that, that we collect for this program. It is not meant for you to explain um, exactly how um, you know, where you're at with each of those types of measures in your application and that we want to know, um, you know, that you are collecting this information already. Um, it's just an FYI that if you are awarded funds uh, through this, this opportunity, that we are going to expect that you already have the capacity and a plan to collect uh, the data for each of those performance measures. Um, so that's really all, um, that's the only reason why it's there, to give you a heads up that you should be ready um, if awarded to start collecting that information for your program. 
Um, the goals, objectives, and deliverables are all directly related to the listed performance measures in Appendix A. Um, and uh, we, we think, help demonstrate the, the work that all of you are doing, um, but um, also for the entire program of family, uh, family drug court program uh, awardees that we have. Um, I will say that we um, are in the process of potentially, um, you know, um, revising performance measures in the future. But what I can say is that um, for right now, you definitely need to be in a position um, to be able to collect each of those measures listed in the solicitation if you are applying for funds. All right. And if you just are really into performance measures and want to learn more about um, the family drug court performance measures that, we're, that we collect right now and understand um, a bit more about um, the Office of Justice programs and all the various different um, programs and, and performance measures that we collect, this is just a link um, where you can go and, and get a general overview of um, performance measurement activity at the Office of Justice programs. So we are nearing the end, um, and I, I wanted to point out the application checklists that are kind of buried at the very end of the solicitation that I, I feel are actually quite critical um, when you are um, preparing your application for federal funding, um, as well as you know, the day of submission. Um, these are checklists that you should definitely have next to you. I say that as someone who um, worked for various uh, different nonprofits, um, applying for federal funds and um, being a grant writer on the other side of things. These checklists were, I, I carried them around with me everywhere when we were um, um, drafting these applications because I was always worried that we weren't going to have everything that we need. Um, and, and the checklists are there so that you can dot your I's and cross your T's and not um, be in a position after the deadline to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot to submit the, the project abstract. Well, if you had your checklist and you could you checked it off and you saw that you uploaded it and it's there, um, you won't have that problem. So please use these checklists. Or you, if you are brand new to applying for federal funds, certainly use these checklists. Um, but Appendix B, um, uh, has the checklist entitled What an Applicant Should Do on page 43. Um, and that's a great checklist for those of you who are brand new to applying for federal funds because there are a number of things that you need to do before you can even um, upload an application for federal funding. And that's not just with us, but for federal funds in general, um, including um, making sure you have a DUNS number, that you register for SAM, and that you register for grants.gov. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, and, I, and it sounds like I'm talking in a foreign language, um, there's a, um, there are wonderful hyperlinks um, that give you information on how uh, to obtain and, and mark those off your checklist. If you are not uh, brand new to applying for federal funds, then um, what an applicant should include checklist um, is definitely something that you should be carrying around with you and making sure that um, <clears throat> you have everything uh, that you need, especially this year, uh, since there are a number of elements uh, listed here that are critical to even cons be considered for, um, for funds. So the project abstract, a budget, um, and budget narrative. I should read budget and budget narrative. Apologize for that. You need to have a program narrative. And then for categories one and two, you need those letters of support or MOUs. Um, those will be uh, critical for you to even can be considered for funding. So if you did not include those in your application, we unfortunately have to automatically disqualify you. Um, so use, use the checklist, that is my advice. Some additional tips. Um, so in previous years, we were allowed to be a bit more wordy in our solicitations. Um, and this year, um, 
you know, we, we were told we were too wordy. So um, my solution to that was to drop things in footnotes. Uh, so my advice to you is to pay attention to the footnotes in the solicitation because that is where um, I was able to dump a lot of great information and resources um, for some of the items that you um, I casually kind of mentioned in the in the solicitation but have very little context or or information on on um, what I'm talking about I dropped it in the footnote so please be sure to check the footnotes because um, that is where I, I tried to, um, you know, include some of my wordiness. Um, again, I already mentioned this, uh, if you are brand new to applying for federal funds, you should allow a, enough time to acquire a DUNS number if you do not have one already, enough time to register with SAM, and enough time to register with grants.gov. Don't do any of this the day before it's due, um, because it, it, it does not take 24 hours to acquire a DUNS number or register with SAM, and you have to make sure both are complete before you're even eligible to submit an application with us or an application for any federal funds. Um, so if you have not done so already, um, I would advise after this webinar that you, you get on that. Um, make sure no more questions have come in. No, moving along. These are some additional useful links. Again, a link to the online um, solicitation, the PDF version of it, and there are hyperlinks to all kinds of very useful information if you are looking at the solicitation online. I know I, I am a person that likes to print things out um, and write on it and, and annotate everything, um, but I just wanted to make sure you have a link to the, the um, web version of the solicitation because there also are a lot, a lot of very useful hyperlinks embedded within the solicitation if you're looking at it online. So just be sure to remember that if you are um, one of those folks that likes to print out everything like me. Um, there's, a, there's also a link to um, FAQs that have come in before this webinar. Um, and there will also be, um, you know, I'm sure many more questions that come in after this webinar. And OJJDP makes sure to publicize every single one of those questions, however detailed or broad, um, online. So check back that link um, often, and because somebody might have asked a question that you didn't even think to ask, um, that might be particularly useful. And then also something that's different in um, the solicitations this year, and instead of giving you a lot of information and how-to information, on things, uh, on, on how to obtain certain things or do, um, for instance, the um, there is a budget and budget narrative template this year um, that we're going to be asking you to to follow. Um, so don't don't try to submit your own template. There is an actual template, but it's embedded in one of the many different hyperlinks in the um, in the solicitation, um, as well as things are just kind of referenced all around to this. 2019 OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. That is your friend now. It actually is incredibly useful. I would um, click on this link and then save it as a, um, a favorite um, because it's a, it's a how-to guide on all the different um, various application requirements that, that um, are listed throughout the solicitation. So um, these are all very useful links that you should just keep as favorites up until um, the date that this application is due. So I'm going to stop. We got some questions coming in. So um, a good question: What is the cost for the um, the annual grantee meetings? Um, so if you look in the solicitation, it, it kind of generally tells you that you need to um, allocate or budget. Um, um, money in your travel section for um, these annual grantee meetings. What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to look at what is the, um, the per diem for um, folks staying in Washington, D.C., so the lodging, the meals and incidentals. Um, and then what you also can do is figure out generally how, how much are flights, uh, round-trip flights, 
from wherever you're located to Washington, D.C. And those are the three different areas that you should make sure you budget for each person going uh, to these annual meetings each year. So four people, four round trip flights to, to Washington, D.C., and then allocating um, uh, lodging and meals and incidentals for two and a half days for each of those four people. Hopefully that's, that's clear. This is also a question that we, we often get and folks get confused. So when you, are, um, when you download the budget and budget narrative template that we have, you'll notice that it's an Excel spreadsheet this year. And it has tabs at the bottom for year one, year two, year three, and it goes all the way up to year five. Um, but this is not a five-year award. So you're going to want to create a budget for year one in the year one tab, the year two tab, and the year three tab. The budget for each of those years ultimately um, get kind of auto-populated in the um, budget summary tab. So you can kind of see, um, you know, go back and forth between each year and see how it's, how it's shaping up in your budget summary to ensure everything is kind of adding up and, and is accurate. Um, so the budget that you submit is going to be for the full three years. So you're going to submit a budget, a year one budget, a year two budget, and a year three budget, and then there's going to be a budget summary for all three years at the end. Another good question. So um, on page, let me make sure I'm directing you to the right page in the solicitation where it lists the, um, the maximum funding amounts for each category of funding. So for example, if it states that awards are, um, will be made for a particular category um, of up to 650000 That 650000 is for all three years. It's not per year. So you have to budget out the 650000 over a three-year period. Hopefully that clarifies any kind of questions about um, the funding amounts. So on page 12, it makes it pretty clear that um, the maximum funding amounts for each category um, and that it'll be, those, those funding amounts are for a 36-month period, so three years. All right. And we will sit tight for um, a little bit for some additional questions that you um, may have been holding out until the end, because we are at the end. So if I didn't address any questions that, that you um, were burning to ask, but hoping that I would maybe touch on during the webinar now is definitely the time. Um, but if there are any questions that came up that um, weren't answered that you definitely typed and and I didn't seem to, um, to answer for you. It may be because it was a little too program specific, a little too specific for the webinar, um, but definitely a good and excellent question um, that I uh, will definitely um, want you to send to NCJRS, um, which is our response center. It's the information, by the way, is listed on page two of the solicitation. Um, where you can ask any of your burning questions that were not answered during this webinar or come up after this webinar. Um, there's a hotline that you can call where you can speak to somebody um, and they'll record your question and make it public to everyone else on the FAQ page um, or you are more than welcome to email the question as well. But we are now open for additional questions. Great. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate it. Um, so here's a couple of questions that we have that uh, maybe if you'd like to repeat or even uh, provide additional information to our webinar participants today on. Uh, one is in regards to maybe subgrantees. Uh, are you allowed to have subgrantees under the solicitation? You are definitely allowed to have subgrantees under the solicitation. Um, many of our grantees have 
um, <clears throat> sub-awardees with, uh, um, with their programs. But I, what I will say that is often kind of um, confusing for our new awardees is that DOJ um, and OJP has a specific definition of what a subgrantee is. Um, and many of our grantees have been surprised to learn that what they thought were just procurement contracts, we actually define as subgrantees. Um, so please just make sure you understand, because um, when you take a look at the budget template, it's going to ask you um, for subgrantees or sub subrecipients, as we might call. And then there's also an, a separate section for procurement contracts, because we do consider them two different things. Um, you can go online, type in Google. There's a link to an excellent toolkit that will um, help you determine whether or not a particular contract that you're considering um, to put in the budget is what we would define as a subgrantee or as just the run-of-the-mill um, procurement contract. Um, if you do find that maybe some of your, your contracts would qualify as a subgrantee under what we define as subgrantees, um, you should then also make make sure that you have um, sub-grantee monitoring policies in place um, because that is going to be um, a question that, that we ask if you are, in fact, awarded funds and you see that you have sub-grantees sub listed in your budget. Great. And another question coming in or that we have here are, applicants allowed to use funding from this grant towards a project that is currently receiving federal funding? The uncomplicated answer is yes. Um, but as many um, uh, folks may or may not um, hear all the time when you have um, programs that are funded by grants, you just need to make sure that there's no supplanting going on. Um, we understand that your programs probably have multiple streams of, of funding coming in uh, just as long as you're not double dipping, um, such as paying for um, Sonia's salary, um, using um, uh, entire salary with, with two different federal awards, then um, you should be good to go. So a lot of our grantees, for instance, have um, a SAMHSA award for their program, and they use their SAMHSA award to just fund the treatment services uh, for their Family Drug Court program, and then uh, they use their OJJDP award to pay for things like staff salaries, um, travel, um, whatever travel expenses they may have, or um, and or evaluation services that they may want to contract out. Great. Um... Another question here, and you mentioned the letters of support earlier, but Catherine, to whom the letters of support should be addressed to? So letters of support um, for uh, OJJDP um, applications are always addressed to the, the sitting OJJDP um, administrator. As you guys may or may not know, our administrator is politically appointed. So um, the administrator can change, um, but um, right now the, our administrator is Karen Harp. So for this solicitation, uh, all letters of support should be addressed to the administrator, Karen Harp. Fantastic. Catherine, what if I submit two applications? Which one will you all review? That is an excellent question and actually happens more often than not. Um, sometimes, actually, folks don't even realize they accidentally submitted twice because they might have submitted their application and were convinced that for some reason it didn't go through, and then they try to submit it again. Um, so that happens, too. Um, regardless, um, we always uh, review the most recently submitted application. So say you submitted the application on May 28th, and then you weren't confident that it went through or you wanted to add something, and you submitted again on May 29th. We disregard the application submitted on May 28th, and we review the one that, that was submitted on May 29th. Great. 
Fantastic. And um, another question here is when will applicants receive announcements or notifications for this grant? So um, the solicitation uh, it indicates that um, regardless of you know whether or not you were awarded, so if you were um, not awarded, you will also receive notification um, on or before September 30th, 2019. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the only information that I can give you. Um, what I can say is that sometimes we've been able to um, send out um, notification well before September 30th, uh, but there have been some, some fiscal years where we just came right down to the wire and we weren't able to actually get um, uh, notifications out until the day of September 30th. So um, you will regardless um, hear something um, by September 30th and um, do not um, you know, kind of freak out if you haven't heard anything, because you will, um, if it's, you know, September 29th and you still haven't heard anything, that's not a bad thing. Um, but you will hear at the very latest by September 30th. So I'm going to actually, we got some other questions coming in through in the chat, um, the chat line here that I want to make sure I look at. Um, there's a specific question asking if housing is allowable under um, this grant. Um, you know, it, there's, there's nothing that's not necessarily allowable if it's a um, service and an enhancement or expansion of services for your, for your program, um, then, then that's, that's totally fine and allowable. So something like residential housing or um, is definitely, um, I know, a huge need for a lot of the parent participants. And if, and if that is your huge need, um, then, then by all means, that is certainly allowable. Um, another question is, is there any registration fees for the um, annual grantee meeting? No, there are no registration fees for the annual grantee meeting. Um, but I think maybe the question was asked that in years past, the grantee meeting has kind of coincided with the NADCP conference for which there is registration fees. Um, so if the NADCP conference is a conference that you definitely um, want to make sure that your um, program staff are able to go to, um, which I highly recommend, it's an excellent conference, um, definitely include that in your budget in addition to the annual grantee meeting. Um, <clears throat> I would separate them out as two different travel travel uh, destinations, um, just because we don't, as I mentioned before, we, we don't know who the um, uh, training and technical assistance provider will be for this cohort of grantees. So um, the annual grantee may, meeting may or may not coincide with the NADCP conference. It might be separate from the NADC, NADCP conference. Um, So if your huge need is that you need to pay the salary of additional staff members in your program, then that is totally allowable by all means. Um, you know, just make sure you, you justify it and explain your need um, in your program narrative. Um, and that is definitely um, um, something that we would support. I'm still reading through some of these questions, so bear with me. So this is a great question. Um, you know, if, is there any um, thing to be anything to think about or consider as far as goals and objectives for um, this grant program? If they're kind of similar or almost the same as another grant program um, that you're either applying for or have received funds for? Um, no. Uh, the only thing that matters is if you're if you're applying for federal funds for two separate, um, through two separate uh, federal agencies, that ultimately what matters is what's in your, what are in your budget. Um, just making sure that you're not asking um, or um, supplanting 
um, any uh, budget line items and that you're asking and budgeting for two for, for separate um, program needs um, but we understand that I mean obviously the the goal is the same for any um, family drug court funder um, which is you know um, supporting the parent participants and their families um, recovery and ultimately keeping families together so um, we understand that the the goals and the objectives will, will be the same just make sure you're not um, at, uh, funding the same the same things in your budget um, so this is a common question um, about evaluation um, and whether or not you should allocate funds for um, a consultant, a third-party evaluator. Um, I think it really depends on the need of your program. Um, if the needs of your program are just far more than evalu needing evaluation, um, then you should focus on the needs of your program. Um, if you, um, if the, one of your needs really truly is evaluation, then we fully support that. Um, I wish, I wish our um, awards could be large enough where we could mandate that everybody hire um, a third-party evaluator um, and make that a requirement of their program design because we really do truly feel like it's a beneficial, positive um, thing to have for your program and ultimately kind of improves the um, outcomes not only for your program but also helps inform us on, in what's working in the field and what's not. Um, so do we recommend it if you have um, the funds to allocate for that? Um, then yes, we definitely highly recommend that for any of the categories of funding, not for just any specific um, category. Um, but again, it's it's specific to to your court needs, um, and if that is just kind of um, a goal that's further down the line for you as far as um, program evaluation, then we tr we understand that as well as well, and it won't hurt your application. All right, more questions. Actually, I think that was. The last question that's come in, um, we could wait a few minutes. Oh, no, we got another one. The question is, is if um, the program already has an evaluator, um, if their services could be used as in kind? And I would think yes. That's great um, if you already have the funds to be um, um, paying for that evaluator as part of your program and you don't need the federal funds, then certainly those services can be um, <clears throat> can be included in the budget as in kind match. All right. I don't see any other questions coming through. So with that, um, if you think of anything, as I said, uh, after this, uh, the conclusion of this webinar, don't fret. Um, the slide up right now is the number and the email address to send any questions that you may have that comes between now and the deadline. Um, it is also listed in, on page two of the solicitation. If you lose slides of this PowerPoint or you're trying to find it or you want to ask that question um, between now and the hour uh, when you're going to receive a copy of these slides, it's on page two of the solicitation. Um, I highly advise that you send um, questions um, to that response center. No question is stupid. Um, we can definitely um, understand that, especially if you're a first-time applicant, we would rather you ask the stupid questions and set you up to success when you submit your application. Um, and since there are no other questions, I thank you for your time. Um, I'm excited to see your applications in about a month from now, um, and I wish you the best of luck. 
All right, Will, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate it. And thank you for everyone who uh, came in and actually listened to the solicitation. Um, <laughs> yes, I would have to agree. You are awesome, Catherine, is what one of our participants <laughs> just said here. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming on today's webinar. Uh, just a few last minute reminders before you all leave for today. Please note that you may contact INTAC through the website displayed on this slide. You can stay up to date on the latest information by signing up for INTAC's TTA listserv. Also, don't forget to check us out on uh, Facebook at OJJDP TTA. You can contact OJJDP via the help desk by following the contact information on this slide. Do you have a TTA need? Please submit a request for help via OJJDP's TTA 360 platform through the link displayed on this slide. And as a reminder to everyone, the webinar recording will be archived on INTAC's YouTube channel, where you can also view past webinars. For the event transcript and supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. Lastly, we would appreciate it if you could please take five minutes to complete the feedback evaluation. Thank you again for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. The host has left the meeting. So at